Welcome to Five Star Weekly. We've got a new player in the house and our Champions League opponent has been revealed. We get into all that and more coming up. Welcome to the show, Five Star Fam. I'm AJ and this is Mark. And wherever it is you get your pods, subscribe, share, and leave us a good rating. This segment is sponsored by Thinking Man Tavern, a cozy Decatur neighborhood pub. Grab a tasty beverage from a wide variety of selections and a plate of something delicious from the menu. To go, check out Thinking Man Tavern. Players are close to reporting to a preseason, and Atlanta United are, of course, in the Champions League. So, in terms of uh, what the league is allowing the teams to do, uh, and what the teams in the Champions League are possibly going to do, is that uh, each team may require their players to report on February 24th, so that's pretty much, depending on when you are watching this, it's a week or less than, uh, you know, away. And so they will have to undergo a seven-day quarantine uh, before beginning group training on March 3rd. So that's very, very soon. Very exciting to hear, of course. But uh, also on a voluntary basis, those players may report uh, during and prior to that February 24th period. Uh, and they can do individual training before. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, that probably bodes well for the likes of the guys that are already there all the time, like Joseph Martinez and uh, the likes. But, um, yeah, we also know our Champions League opponent in the round of 16, and it, it is El de Alajuelense. Uh, that's what's funny is last week, of course, yeah, you know, totally butchered that name, but now, yes, Fully have to learn this very, very well now. But uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, <laughs> Alajolense, uh, yeah, you know, they're a they're going to be a tough team. But actually, let's get into what, you know, this is for Atlanta United. This will be our third time playing in the Champions League. Uh, we, of course, qualified because we are the holders of the U.S. Open Cup. And uh, whether through, you know... <laughs> merit or not we have uh yeah pipped another berth into the champions league but uh yeah we uh of course last season we knocked out costa rican team arediano um and we were eliminated or sorry that's in 2019 rather uh but we were eliminated by monterey in 2019 and we knocked out matagua last season and we were knocked out by club america uh so uh, and that was, of course, like, you know, a couple months ago. So <laughs> very, uh, very strange indeed, all of it pretty much. But uh, yes, the uh, Costa Rican teams are going to be tough. And this one in Alajuelense is going to be no slouch either. They're in good form in their league. Uh, they are currently in season. So it's another one of those things that we'll have to be dealing with. Uh, the actual dates could be around April in terms of uh, pretty much I think from April 6th to the 14th if I recall and so uh, it's anywhere from those that kind of time frame so we have a little bit of time to prep but in terms of being able to play a friendly or any of that we won't have that and it will be our first match of the season so it is something that we will have to contend with but Moving on to Alajuelense and who they are. They are one of the winningest teams in Costa Rica. Uh, they have 30 first division titles. Uh, that's quite a bit. And uh, but and they're still not even the best in, in their uh, their league. That's they're maybe the, the second uh, most storied team uh, in Costa Rica. But uh, Boca Negra said that it will definitely be a tough matchup. They are in good form already. Uh, yeah, we have our hands full with uh, this type of team, for sure. And uh, what's funny is their star striker, their uh, yeah, 20-year-old Jurgens Montenegro, he was wrongfully uh, pretty much linked with us uh, during the winter. Uh, he pretty much, uh, there's his agency is in Atlanta. He made a trip, and uh, for some reason, he, in terms of a transfer rumor, was linked with us and well now it turns out that we're going to be facing him so 
kind of very strange. We'll get kind of that first-hand view of Montenegro after all. But uh, yeah, what are your uh, what are your thoughts on Alajuelense and uh, this type of draw? Uh, are you excited for it? And yeah, any other thoughts on it? Um, I'm definitely excited for it, uh, I, and I do think it'll be tough because I mean, like, anytime you're talking about, I think uh, you know Costa Rica is probably a little bit a cut above from the rest of um, Central America and the Caribbean for sure. So. Um, you know, and then like you're talking about not just any old team, but uh, probably the second most storied team, as you mentioned, because you know you everyone is familiar with Saprissa, you know what I mean. But uh, in, instead, we get uh, one of apparently one of Saprissa's biggest competitors, and so mm-hmm. um, yeah, I am expecting a tough match, especially you know having that they have to travel. Um, you know, it's going to be their first game of the season, as opposed to Alajuelense. Uh, uh, you know, being in season already, and so, and as you mentioned, they're off to a good start. So actually, this will probably be uh, the toughest first round draw that we've had so far in the uh, Concacaf Champions League. Yeah, and in terms of uh, total market value uh, for this team, though, they, uh, according to transfer market, are worth five point eight six million. And yeah, LA United that. Yeah, that's like the cost of you know a third of Barco essentially. So yeah, we uh, you know we have them covered in terms of market value, but uh, in terms of talent, they're definitely going to be someone to contend with. But uh, yeah, do you do you ultimately think we'll be able to you know get past them? Like, is, is this uh, a big enough test, but also some you know a test that we can actually pass? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I have more confidence in Atlanta United right now because of the roster building that's been done so far. Um, and so, you know, like you, you make a couple, you make one significant signing from South America, you know, in addition to um, the signings that you've made uh, late last year and, uh, you know, whatever other players that they, that they eventually bring in. I think that I think that we should have the players to compete um i know it's gonna be difficult it's gonna be difficult that they don't have that we don't have a preseason um just you just it's you cannot recreate like match situations in practice you can try but uh you know they're ultimately just scrimmages and so um maybe a case where the first leg they have to grind a bit they have to uh suffer as uh that seems to be a new buzzword but uh and as we have in uh in first legs so exactly exactly yeah if we if we can pull off a 1-1 in the first leg i think i'd be pretty happy with that um i think ultimately we can get it done because i believe in the manager and i think that we have the players to do it yeah and uh yeah so if we do advance uh the quarterfinals uh they would happen around late april or early may but uh it would be against either philadelphia union or saprisa so, uh, yeah, very tough matchups looming there, too. So, uh, but definitely not maybe on the level of a Club America. So that's probably at least, uh, you know, yeah. there, there's a slight better chance that we could advance uh, past our regular route. But moving on from that, new details on the MLS U22 initiative have been revealed according to the Athletics' Sam Stechgall. And uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the eligibility, uh, what he lined out was that uh, each player cannot turn 23 in the first season of their contract. And uh, once they're tagged as a U22 initiative player, that uh, they will stay under the designation until they turn 25. So yeah, those were some questions that were uh, definitely big ones regarding this uh, this whole thing. Uh, this is weirdly, uh, homegrowns and draftees also eligible for the tag, which I suppose if they outgrow their designations, but yeah, homegrowns, they don't really count against the cap, so you'd imagine they probably want to keep them a homegrown in, in terms of if they're a team. Right. But um, yeah, and then most draftees probably are fitting this uh, type of thing as well, unless they just come really, really young. So that's a kind of bizarre kind of addition in there, but... Uh, also, that uh, so each team has three of them. Uh, there's unlimited acquisition costs uh, for these type of players, so it pretty much acts pretty much like a DP as well. Uh, 
uh, and that the salary is capped around the max budget charge. So uh, the players can be, they hit that budget at that reduced charge of 150,000 or 200,000 uh, from what Stechgal has gathered. And uh, he also said that Santiago Sosa, who we'll pretty much get to in a second, is a U22 uh, initiative player. And that he also assumes that it's a safe bet that Eric Lopez is as well. So, yeah, so far we have two of those players as U22 uh, initiative. So, you know, very interesting, definitely. Um, you know, there might be another player that might be coming in that might be fitting that bill as well. Depends, of course, on the price tag, but uh, we'll, you know, get to that when we get to it. Uh, but let's get to the official uh, announcement of one of those players coming in in Santiago Sosa from River Plate. He, uh, according to uh, German Garcia Grova, was that uh, he did come in for a $6 million transfer fee. And uh, yes, he is a holding midfielder. And Carlos Bocanegra said that, uh, yeah, he is a, uh, a holding midfielder that understands and reads the game exceptionally well for someone his age. Uh, he has experienced numerous big matches in both Copa Libertadores, Libertadores sorry, and the Copa Diego Maradona, in addition to his time with the U uh, Argentina U20s. And so he's got a significant amount of experience in terms of uh, some fairly big matches but not a ton of uh you know playing time for river plate uh, you know in all in all and especially for his age uh he was maybe a little bit not uh always favored for the first team by marcelo gallardo but definitely uh a guy that uh definitely drew some attention from across the world and uh, at one point, he was going to go to Everton for a $15 million move. Uh, that was back in 2019, but the move was scrapped due to work permit issues. So it definitely is. We're getting a guy that brings, uh, you know, some good, uh, I think, kind of, you know, kind of that pedigree in terms of, uh, you know, as a, a young prospect that has a lot of promise. But uh, yeah, what what are your thoughts on bring in Sosa? Yeah, I mean from the highlights, um, you know it seems like he has good energy. You know, uh, not shy in the tackle. Um, you know, good releases the ball quickly. You know, keep it ticking. Uh, I think what I am most at this point, what I'm most curious and excited about is seeing uh, Sosa and Moreno specifically. Mm. Um, because I think Moreno, will, you figure Moreno will be a huge part of the plans going forward unless, you know, something goes wrong. But yeah. um, but no, he looked good towards the end of last year. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm hoping that they can replicate. I want to be clear. I'm not comparing one player to another. Mm. I'm hoping they can replicate what uh, Nagby and Rometty gave us as a partnership. Yeah. um you know the 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 steel the energy um and then also uh giving being able to give you something going forward right. so uh you know it'll be interesting to see how uh NCAA uses uh uses his midfielders but obviously now hopefully we've got a pretty good one in sosa right and uh yeah definitely i think in terms of uh yeah press resistant he's definitely one of those type of players as well so yeah, he really, you know, if all goes well, is a guy that kind of could replicate what Nagby does. Uh, yeah, again, we're not going to put all our eggs into that basket, but yeah, he uh, does seem to profile as that type of player. And he's also, according to Peter Coates of uh, Golasso Argentino, has played some center back as well. And so, yeah, he could be a guy that kind of, uh, yeah, slips further back to help us out. Maybe uh, if he has to split those center backs as well, um, you know, that could be a route that uh, Hainsey could use him. But uh, yes, of course, he will fill that U22 initiative. Uh, and, you know, that will be, yeah, quite good if we, uh, you know, get the best out of Sosa and then we sell him on. You know, this is, I think, all just kind of part of the pipeline of what Atlanta United is trying to do. Uh, but. Yeah, he's a guy that I think brings a lot of promise to pretty much solidify our midfield, which has been necessary. Because, of course, uh, also one of the guys that is outgoing 
as Eric Rometty. And so, yes, Eric Rometty has officially moved on to San Jose Earthquakes. He was traded for up to $500,000 in general allocation money. And uh, so LA, LA United will uh, initially receive $200,000 in GAM and uh, kind of another additional $300,000 in additional incentives. So if those are met, then we could get up to 500,000. That's uh, what do you th what do you think about that in terms of the uh, you know amount of gam that we could potentially get? Is this a good deal? And did this have to happen? Yeah, I think the writing was on the wall. To be honest, um, you know, we and we kind of talked about this in previous episodes, but essentially, it just seemed like uh, the fit was just not there. And then when you remove Nagby from the equation, you know, it's kind of like, well, what is Remedy's best role? You know, he's not quite a holding midfielder um he's a decent box-to-box -box midfielder but um i think for i think this make this move makes sense for uh san jose and uh, matias almeida you know he plays the, an aggressive man marking style uh there's going to be a lot of chasing of the ball i think remedy in theory should do well and so um and you can understand the club wanting to back their manager um all that being said i think atlanta united did well in terms of the allocation money they could potentially get um because if I remember correctly, uh, Nagby trade um, they it was received a mil. uh, yeah. one, one million flat or 1.5. Oh, yeah, yeah, it might have been. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, you know, like, so you can you kind of look at it like that. You know, it's like that, I, I think that that's a decent feat. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how, um, you know, if Atlanta United is able to maneuver with that game at all before the season starts or in the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, as I've said before, there's really no point in keeping a player that's uh not going to get a whole, whole lot of playing time, you know, and then you risk like having um, a negative vibe in the dressing room and all that. And so I think Atlanta United did what they needed to do, yeah, and uh, definitely, yeah, Rometty has had some very, very good moments in Five Stripes. And yeah, in terms of my favorite moments, I think is Minnie's uh, favorite moments is the Shemetti that he rocked right after he bungled that goal home against NYCFC. But uh, yeah, he's had definitely, I think, a lot of other moments as well throughout his time in uh, maybe the social media videos during the FIFA reveals as well. And, yeah. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah, do you have a, a favorite moment that I didn't talk about uh, for Remedy? Oh, we got to talk about uh, the semifinal versus Orlando. He scores the opening goal. And, uh, you know, it's like we didn't have Joseph in that game. It's like, where are the goals going to come from? Up steps Remedy, you know? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> That's probably a close second uh, in terms of um, favorite moments. But yeah, he always just seemed like that, that fun guy, the glue guy, mm -hmm. um, you know. And uh, I, honestly, I do wish him well in San Jose. Right. Because, yeah, he definitely, uh, in his message for Atlanta, saying his goodbyes, uh, he said on his IG post, Thank you for the last two and a half incredible years. Today is time to say goodbye to a place where I was very happy and made many fun memories. I don't want to only say goodbye to the club, but also want to thank all the fans for the support and love you showed me since the day I arrived. I want to thank the special club staff, which are many and have always been there to help us with any of our needs. Thank you to my teammates and friends for being there for me for this whole time. The player in me is leaving, but the 17 in me will always wish this club and city the best. Good luck. I mean, damn. He, uh, he... Either got a you know a ghostwriter or man he uh, <laughs> he really yeah he tugged tugged at those heartstrings for sure the seventeen in me is uh, well done well done Remedy jeez but uh, <laughs> I mean yeah you know he definitely uh, also got some love from previous teammates as well Captain Parky also wrote on Twitter he said uh, of that NYCFC goal one of the biggest goals in Atlanta United history. That win gave us the confidence to go win the MLS Cup. We'll miss seeing you in red and black. Good luck, hermano. So, uh, and then Eric Rometty promptly replied with, uh, thanks you for all, Captain. <laughs> There's a little bit of uh, broken English there, but that's why I think there might have been a little ghostwriter for that English part. That uh, <laughs> Or Google Translate is really, really good for him. Either way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
he uh, he did a good job. But yes, uh, thank you for everything, Eric Rometty. Uh, you know, especially for 2018. Uh, yeah, he was exactly what we needed, but unfortunately, it just didn't work out as well in 2019 and 2020. But uh, on to another former five stripe now in uh, yeah, you know, at least for the this year. But uh, Loney for Newell's Old Boys, Franco Escobar, unfortunately is injured now and uh he fractured his metatarsal in his foot and uh yeah it seems like the recovery period will be about three months and uh yeah that is very tough to hear unfortunately for escobar who had just made the move last week to newell's yeah. old boys to his uh pretty much his you know boyhood club and yeah unfortunately he's gonna be sidelined for a good bit of it now and whether yeah, I mean, he's going to be on loan, so it's one of those, he's, they have the option to buy. Uh, do you think this impacts, you know, what could happen for Escobar? I mean, would he, like, pretty much kind of awkwardly return to the Five Stripes? I mean, yeah, what do you think? Yeah, I guess that's always a possibility. I mean, you know, it's not like uh, Argentina teams have a whole lot of money to throw around right now. So they, they're going to have to be, you know, very particular about how they spend it. I do feel like um, San Lorenzo ultimately wants to bring him in on a personal deal. Oh, uh, um, sorry. Yeah. Newell's old boys, you mean? Permanent. News. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was reading the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> News old boys. Yeah, I'm sure, the, you know, I'm sure ultimately they'd like to bring him uh, on a permanent deal. But um you know, if if I think that he can, if he comes back in three months and you know uh, plays and plays well, I think that could still happen. But if there's like a reoccurrence or another injury, then yeah, I do think it would throw that move in jeopardy. Yeah, and I think they've uh, you know they pretty much uh, they raised the player for lack of a better word. You know they uh, you know in terms of through their academy, and so he's a guy that they know fairly well. So it is. Uh, yeah, while he's not going to be there for three months, I think they know his quality. That's why they brought him in. But yeah, it still yeah could very well have that impact, and he we could be seeing him back in five stripes uh, next year. Who knows? But um, yeah. So uh, on to another uh, or more transfer rumors from this past week. Fernando Mesa again uh, is linked away uh, this time to San Lorenzo. Uh, on a one-year free loan, and which doesn't really seem that great of a deal there. Uh, I, mean, I think it might just be to get his wages off the books, possibly. Uh, and mm -hmm. yeah, he did have an up-and-down season, kind of injury-riddled a bit. Uh, but you know, he is a guy that's experienced in uh, definitely uh, you know Champions League stuff, and also uh, against Mexican teams. So he would be a useful guy if we do face them. Uh, but, you know, it is a guy that is 30 years old. It's, you know, that's definitely uh, probably a big factor into all of this. Uh, we probably want to get mm -hmm. somebody a little younger, uh, just maybe uh, just slightly less experienced, but very experienced. Um, you know, that could, we you know, we could build with, you know, Miles Robinson with for the future. But, you know, yeah. in terms of those, uh, what we have incumbent, if Mesa moves, it would just be Robinson walks Campbell, George Campbell, and uh, maybe Efren Morales, maybe Josh Bauer. I mean, would you be confident going into the season with just that as our center back depth? No, not really. <laughs> you know, like I, 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 that if it were that, then I'd be hoping that George Campbell is ready. But you know, he hasn't played all that much yet. Um, yeah, the that's a really the Fernando Mesa rumor is interesting because it really just smacks of like the club is just trying to get rid of a player, and uh, if if that is the case, then you have to figure that they're trying to replace that player, because uh, yeah, I mean as you just said, I mean that's not a whole lot of depth. It's essentially like Miles Robinson and the crew, you know, like with walks playing a good bit of those games most likely. So it's. Um, Mm, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, I guess it still have a couple months until the season starts, so we'll have to see how that plays out. Right. I mean, definitely we were looking at the likes of Hector David Martinez, of course, of River Plate, and that move is official. Uh, he has gone back to River Plate. Uh, so, yeah, that profile is probably what we're looking for, though. You know, the ball-playing, left-footed center back uh, that can right. join in the attack at times and... 
uh, you know, spread the ball around. And yeah, I think we'll still probably be able to find something like that. Uh, it would just kind of have to, they had to reset probably their plans because River Plate pretty much hijacked that move. So <laughs> what can you do? Right. <laughs> um, but anyway, another transfer rumor this past week. Uh, so reportedly, LA United are finalizing the signing of Darwin Mateos of Zamora FC. Uh, he's a 19-year-old winger from Venezuela, and he could spend time with LA United too, depending on the room on the first team roster, according to Nico Moreno. But uh, yeah, I mean, he's a two-footed attacker, a guy that can play on either wing. Uh, yeah, a, a guy that could be fairly useful in terms of, uh, you know, a guy that can grow uh, into the team and, you know, go from LA United 2 into the first team. That would be, you know, a good weapon, a guy that can, you know, play on both sides, can, uh, yeah, break down teams on the dribble, which, you know, you always, it's always, I think, uh, you can't have enough of those guys, I feel like, but, right. yeah. um, yeah, what, what, what's your, uh, you know, what, what's your thoughts on, you know, this, you know, Mateos possibly coming in? Yeah, um, you know, obviously I can't speak to actually having seen him play but uh an interesting prospect you know um you know again looking at the age you know somebody who can spend time with the twos and then possibly uh make a contribution to the first team all that's great you know uh, in terms of uh the right type of move i think so um yeah i think you know uh, that's just one where again we'll see how that plays out but i like the idea behind it mm -hmm. and uh yeah i mean he scored nine goals in 41 league games uh, so that's a good amount of experience for a 19 year old as well and he's also picked up minutes in the Copa Sudamericana so yeah you know a guy that uh, you know has some good bit of experience at a young age not bad not mm -hmm. bad so uh, on to the last topic of the news uh, very divisive topic it seems like but uh, of course we've all seen what the kit looks like in the leaks but there will be a kit launch event, uh, it seems like, at Mercedes-Benz Stadium. I would assume probably, they've called it a drive-in, so I would assume it's probably in the Home Depot backyard. But uh, essentially, they have asked fans to not only, or in terms of uh, season ticket holders, make a short uh, kind of video talking about their favorite Atlanta United memory, but also that, uh, yeah, there will be codes and a $20 uh, kind of charge, but that will also be going into uh, the Streets Dreams Foundation, uh, and they will be matching funds by American Family Insurance and the LA United Foundation. Uh, and that will benefit the Piedmont Healthcare Foundation to support COVID-19 relief and frontline workers. So it's for a good cause in terms of that. Uh, it seems like they're probably definitely trying to limit the amount of people that are uh, able to go to this right. event for obvious reasons, uh, but right. also uh, because, yeah, the demand probably will be, yeah, far exceeding the actual ability for them to accommodate everybody. But, uh, yeah, you're not a season ticket holder, but, uh, you know, what are your thoughts on, I think pretty much people are, are thinking... You know, they're making people jump through a lot of hoops uh, to really just have the chance to buy the kit. And yes, they are going to stream this event for the general public as well. Uh, right. So, you know, if you can't make it and you're not a season ticket holder, you will be able to watch it on the day. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, do you feel like if you were a season ticket holder, is this much? Is this too much? Uh, <laughs> for me personally, yeah, it would be, uh, <laughs> to be honest, like, I'm just, I don't, I don't do, you know, I don't normally do videos. Like, obviously I've done them for the channel, you know, but yeah. that's, uh, <laughs> that actually to me makes a little more sense. But I mean, uh, it's this, I mean, they have to limit the numbers, um, because of the pandemic. Like they, you know, it's just something that they have to do. So, you know, you could go about it with a lottery type system or uh you know uh, i guess a case where you know if you missed out on tickets uh last year maybe you get bumped up the line or whatever but they they've gone a different route and um yeah it'd be i guess it, i'm curious to see like what their criteria is in terms of like standing out you know what i'm saying yeah. um and i guess that's really the bit where i would be like 
I don't really want to do this because you know, the, you know, it's like essentially, it is a little bit of performing, you know. So mm. it's um, but I you know I don't say that to discourage people from doing this. Like I think it can be fun, and um, you know, at the end of the day, if you want to, you know, relive uh, a memory of yours with the rest of the community, um, you get a chance to do that. So yeah, um, yeah, it's probably not for me, uh, <laughs> but. Uh, I I guess I give them plaudits for trying to be creative. Right. Yeah, I think they're definitely, uh, yeah, kind of getting the kind of user to generate this content for sure for them. And they'll probably likely, uh, they'll probably put some sort of super cut all together of all these uh, ones that I think struck their fancy. And, you know, it'll tug at our heartstrings when they show it, you know, maybe before the kit launch. And But, uh, yeah... I think maybe it's because also why this there's this divisive uh, reaction to it is also uh, that the kit itself in terms of the leak is as divisive as ever. Uh, so people's reactions are definitely, I think, uh, you know, a little muted at times with this. And some people are very excited, of course. But uh, yeah, it kind of adds to all of this kind of uh, discussion that's been happening on social media. And... Uh, yeah, I think personally for me, uh, I guess it's, you know, I'm used to, I guess, making videos, so I kind of popped one out uh, before this, and, you know, there we go. Uh, it wasn't that huge of a deal, but, yeah, I mean, there is, yeah, a lot of barriers to entry here, for sure. I mean, you know, you not only have to make a video, uh, there's a code that they give you afterwards, uh, and then on Friday, we'll have to make sure you're one of the first people to to you know log in and punch the code in and uh so you have a chance to go and then uh then you actually have to drive there and yeah it's like a yeah i can see how there's like a you know a thing for people that uh might really discourage them and so i get it the barriers to entry i think are on purpose then you know a lot of people that don't want to do this they'll just watch from home and that's probably totally fine so uh, but yeah, let us yeah. know in the comments below if you're one of the season ticket holders and have done this or feel a way strongly about it the other way. But anyway, uh, that pretty much does it for the news and gets us to the question of the day. So uh, the question of the day is that the roster is coming into shape a bit, but how would you line up the boys if uh, the current roster is uh, right now what would that 11 look like? So let us know in the comments below. We're looking forward to your 11s in the comments. But guys, that's the entire show. Remember to like, share, comment, subscribe. And for Mark, I'm AJ. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah.